It was over uh, 50 years ago that a philosopher by the name of Peter Singer wrote an essay about the famine in Biafra. Does anybody remember Biafra from the 1970s? Uh, and in that essay, he conjured up a thought experiment known as the shallow pond experiment. Maybe some of you have heard of this. This is the way it goes. Imagine you're walking on the way to work or maybe on the way to church and you're passing a shallow pond or maybe a shallow pool. Uh, and you know that that pool of water is about four feet deep, you know, maybe up to your waist. Uh, and as you walk past it, you see a child struggling in the water, uh, about to drown. And we know it's very possible for a child to drown in shallow water. Uh, and you can save the child, but in Singer's example, he says, well, you just bought a new pair of shoes and pants, and you're going to be late for work. We could update the experiment and say you've got your brand new iPhone in your back pocket, right? And it's worth a lot of money, and you don't want to ruin that. And so the question is, should you save the child that's drowning? And the answer, obviously, is of course. Uh, we would consider anyone who didn't save the child to be a monster, you know, totally immoral, to, to value their pants and their shoes or their iPhone over the life of the child. And so then Singer goes on to say in this uh, essay that just as certainly as we saw a drowning child and know that we should save the child, we know that there are uh, children starving around the world. In his case, he was talking about Biafra. There was this civil war going on uh, with Nigeria. And he makes the point that for the same sort of sacrifice, of minimal sacrifice, he's from Britain, so he said five British pounds per person. For five British pounds per person, all of the starving children could be saved. And he makes the point that just as it's a moral obligation to save the drowning child, it's a moral obligation to save the starving children. Now, of course, uh, Singer's argument didn't convince everyone. First of all, not a lot of people read philosophy journals, so he probably didn't uh, uh, touch a lot of people. Uh, but of course, some children were saved. In fact, there's someone uh, here in the church today from that time. But we ask ourselves the question, or I'm asking the question, why is that? Uh, and it's because it's somewhat a human um, instinct to care about a child that we see here and now in front of us uh, who is drowning, but we don't have that same instinct for a child that is perhaps halfway around the world. So it's kind of part of the way that we're hardwired that we don't have that same instinct of people and lives that are further away. What does this have to do with the gospel, you might be thinking? I think the connection is today our scripture readings and the words of Jesus to us are really challenging us to go against some of our instincts, some of which what we might call common sense, uh, to respond differently as disciples. And especially on this long weekend when we celebrate Independence Day, I think it's a great opportunity not just to reflect upon our freedoms, but a chance to think about the purpose of our freedom and how we use those freedoms. Now we're all very familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, probably from Matthew chapter 5. And now for the last few weeks, we've been hearing what's sometimes called the Sermon on Mission or uh, the, 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 the mission discourse, missionary discourse in St. Matthew's Gospel. So we've been reading Matthew's Gospel chapter 10 for the past several weeks. And in that chapter 10 of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is instructing his uh, apostles, the disciples, before he sends them out to the villages of Judea and Galilee. Uh, and so Jesus is talking to them about discipleship, what they are to do, and how they are to live. What have we heard? What did they hear? So I'm going to recount a little bit of what uh, we've heard over these past weeks. First, Jesus tells them, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Proclaim the good news, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Then he tells them how they should be doing this. Take no payment, no gold or silver. Uh, don't carry an extra bag or an extra pair of shoes. Work for what you eat. 
And after giving, him these or giving them these orders about what they should do and how they should do it, he tells them how they're going to be received. Uh, and it's not very good news. Right? He says, I'm sending you out like sheep amidst the wolves. Brother is going to betray brother. Father and children. Children are going to be raised up against parents. All of these things. And then Jesus saying, don't think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword, and by a sword he means conflict. So, friends, that's what we've been listening to for the past several weeks from just one chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And it's a very, I think, it's a very difficult portion of Scripture. Now, it probably wasn't preached exactly the way we hear it today because we know that some of these sayings are found in other places in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Mark and Matthew probably is collecting them and placing them here. But I do think that Jesus is teaching us something very, very important here. Uh, two essential aspects uh, for the life of a missionary disciple and for the life, lives of all of us as his disciples. First thing he's teaching us is that our bond with Jesus has to be stronger than any other bond. That's what we heard this morning something very opposed to our instincts, that we would put Jesus before our mothers and our fathers and our sisters and our brothers and our children. So that's first. And then, when we are disciples, that when we are going out, we are not bringing ourselves, the disciple does not come herself or himself, but we are actually bringing Jesus to the people who we meet. And then, through Jesus, we are bringing them the love of God the Father. And I think these two aspects are really closely connected because the more Jesus is at the center of our lives, the more we will be able to bring this presence of Christ and God the Father to others. Those two things go hand in hand. So I think if I was trying to condense all of this down to one sentence, and you might have preferred that I would just condense it to one sentence, uh, it's just to say that Jesus is telling us to prefer God over the things that God has given us, even the most valuable things that God has given us, like our family relationships. And this is a, a very difficult message, but it is a message that is at the heart of the gospel. We, we heard it plainly this morning. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And again, this goes against our natural instincts. And so I think this scripture uh, and this weekend when we celebrate freedom gives us this opportunity to ask ourselves again, how do I use this, my freedom? How do I love? Whom do I love? And perhaps the most important question of all, how can I love like Jesus? We know that there's no true love without the cross. We just heard that, without a personal price to pay. Immediately following this, chapter 10, uh, we go to chapter 11 of Matthew's Gospel, and we hear one of my favorite scripture passages, which is John the Baptist sending his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one that we've been waiting for, or should we look for another? And it's kind of amazing that even John the Baptist, who was the herald of Jesus, uh, was unsure because Jesus was such an unexpected Messiah. Are you the one, he asks, and Jesus' answer, you probably remember, is go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And I think for us, likewise, we will be known as disciples by what people hear and see about us when they look at us. And so I would say, let us be like uh, the wise woman who we heard in the first reading, uh, invite the prophets into our home. Not literally. You don't have to make up the spare bedroom like, like she did in the, in, the, in the scripture. But invite the prophets into our home to hear what they have to tell us. Uh, what do we need to hear? What are today's prophets talking about? Who are the children who are drowning in the pool who need our help? Is it the children in our own community who are injured and dying from gun violence? 126 last year, injured and dying. 
Is it the children who need clean air and clean water and food uh, in third world countries? Is it the immigrant children on our own border who are fleeing violence and coming to us for safety? Is it the children of different races here uh, in our own community in the United States who are, who are striving for justice? All of those things may be the children uh, in the shallow pond who we need to respond to. Now, if these sound too big, they sound too big to me, uh, if we feel inadequate to address things, poverty, hunger, injustice, we can ask ourselves, is there something I can do, as the Lord told us, to give that simple cup of cold water? What is it that I can do, not tomorrow, but today, to celebrate our freedom, to celebrate our independence that we have here in the United States, and take up our cross and live as disciples.